These were sleek P-51 Mustangs, with distinctive scoop intakes and bubble canopies. They were flying combat air patrol over Tokyo itself, over the Imperial Palace, over the homeland. Shimizu's first thought was that he must be hallucinating from oxygen deprivation, because what he was seeing was physically impossible. Every engineer in Japan knew this. Every pilot knew this. Single-engine fighters could not fly from any American base to Tokyo and back. The mathematics didn't work. The fuel didn't exist. And yet there they were, 1,500 miles from the nearest American airfield, hunting Japanese interceptors over the capital. The strategic problem had been killing Americans for months. By early 1945, B-29 Super Fortresses were reaching Tokyo regularly from the Mariana Islands, Saipan, Tinian, Guam. The bombers could make the round trip. Barely. But the 1,500-mile journey left them vulnerable for hours over Japanese-controlled territory. Japanese fighter interceptors, Zeros, Tojos, Jacks, anything that could climb, would swarm the formations. The B-29s flew at 25,000 to 30,000 feet, but Japanese fighters could reach them. Without escort, the bombers relied on their own defensive guns and tight formation flying. It wasn't enough. Losses were mounting. On some missions, 5% of the bombers didn't come home. On bad days, 10%. The mathematics were brutal. If you flew 30 missions, your odds of survival dropped below 50%. Crews were getting torn apart. Waste gunners watching fighters make head-on passes. Tail gunners tracking zeros coming in from 6 o'clock. Engineers trying to keep damaged engines running for three more hours over the Pacific. The psychological weight was crushing. The Army Air Forces needed fighter escorts over Tokyo, but the engineering analysis said it was impossible. The P-51D Mustang was the best fighter in the American inventory. Rolls-Royce Merlin, Phi-1650, seven engine producing, 1,490 horsepower. Top speed 437 MPH at 25,000 feet. 650 caliber machine guns. Combat radius with internal fuel, 950 miles. That was the problem. Combat radius meant the distance you could fly out, fight for 15 to 20 minutes burning fuel and combat power, then fly home with a 30 minute reserve. Tokyo was one yell 500 miles from the Mariana Islands. Even after American Marines captured Iwo Jima in March 1945, taking 26,000 casualties to secure that volcanic rock. Tokyo was still 660 nautical miles away. Round trip, 1,320 miles minimum. Add combat maneuvering, wind, navigation errors, emergency reserves. You needed 1,600 miles of range. The P-51 was 650 miles short. The fuel required didn't fit in the aircraft. The weight of additional fuel would exceed structural limits. The engine consumption rate at cruise power was fixed by thermodynamics. Japanese engineers had done the same calculations. They knew American fighters couldn't reach Tokyo. The homeland was safe. B-29s could be intercepted without worrying about escort fighters. Japanese pilots could make multiple attack passes, reload, refuel, attack again. The strategic calculus favored Japan. Interceptors could operate from airfields around Tokyo, landing, rearming, launching again while the bomber stream passed overhead. One Japanese fighter could engage multiple bombers across a single raid. The Americans couldn't protect their bombers. The mathematics proved it. Physics proved it. Every aviation engineer in the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force had confirmed it. They were all about to be proven catastrophically wrong. Flight Sergeant Tataro Shimizu's hands tightened on his control stick as he climbed toward the bomber formation over Tokyo. The morning sky was crystal clear. April 7, 1945. 0947 hours. He'd been scrambled dozens of times to intercept B-29 superfortresses. Each time, the same ritual. Climb hard, attack fast, pray the Americans didn't see you coming. But as Shimizu punched through 18,000 feet, what he saw made his blood freeze. There, weaving among the silver bombers like sharks in a feeding frenzy, were single-engine fighters. Not Navy Corsairs from carriers offshore. The Americans weren't trying to change the laws of physics. They were trying to bend them. Just enough. The engineering breakthrough came from external fuel tanks. Drop tanks that could be jettisoned after use. The concept wasn't new. 
P-51s had been using 75-gallon and 110-gallon drop tanks in Europe, but 110 gallons only added 220 miles of range, still 430 miles short of Tokyo. So American engineers designed larger tanks, 150-gallon external tanks, fabricated from pressed paper impregnated with resin to save weight. Each tank added 300 miles of range, two tanks, 600 miles. Suddenly, the mathematics shifted. Internal fuel, 950 miles. Two 150-gallon drop tanks, 600 miles. Total theoretical range, 1,550 miles. Just barely enough to reach Tokyo and return to Iwo Jima, but that was theoretical maximum range. The real breakthrough was in the mission profile. Fly high, 22,000 to 25,000 feet, where the air was thin and engine efficiency peaked. Lean the fuel mixture to the absolute minimum that wouldn't damage the engine. Use cruise power, not normal power. Save every drop of fuel. Jettison the external tanks as soon as they were empty, reducing drag and weight. Escort the bombers to the target. Engage Japanese fighters only if necessary. Every minute of combat burned fuel at three times the cruise rate. Then nurse the aircraft home, praying the headwinds didn't pick up, praying you didn't have to dogfight, praying you calculated correctly. There was no margin for error. None. If you got into a prolonged dogfight over Tokyo, you didn't have enough fuel to make it home. You'd ditch in the Pacific. If you got lost, you'd run out of fuel. If the winds shifted, you'd run out of fuel. If your engine consumed slightly more fuel than calculated, you'd run out of fuel. The mathematics allowed for exactly zero mistakes. But the alternative was watching B-29 crews die. On April 7, 1945, the Seven Fighter Command launched the first very long-range escort mission to Tokyo. Major James Varnell led 108 P-51 Mustangs off the runway at Iwo Jima at 0545 hours. North Field had only been operational for three weeks. The concrete was still being poured on some taxiways. The fighters carried two 150-gallon drop tanks each. The pilots had been briefed on fuel management. Climb at 160 mail Zwermart indicated. Level off at 22,000 feet. Lean the mixture until the engine ran rough, then enrich in one click. Cruise at 265 mail true airspeed. Drop the external tanks when empty. Rendezvous with the B-29s 200 miles south of Tokyo. Stay with them to the target. Engage enemy fighters only to protect the bombers. Do not chase Japanese fighters away from the formation. Do not dogfight unless absolutely necessary. Then come home. Watch your fuel gauges. If you have less than 100 gallons when you leave Tokyo, you're not making it back. The psychological pressure was immense. Every pilot knew they were attempting something that had never been done before. Every pilot knew the fuel calculations had zero margin. One mistake meant ditching in the Pacific hoping the Navy would find you before hypothermia or sharks did. But every pilot also knew that B-29 crews were dying because they had no escort. That motivated them. That mathematics mattered. The flight to Tokyo took three hours and 40 minutes. Three hours and 40 minutes of watching fuel gauges, watching the ocean, watching the sky. No radio chatter. Radio silence all the way to reduce the chance of Japanese early warning. Just 108 Mustangs flying in formation through empty sky, each pilot alone with his fuel calculations. At 8.30 hours, the P-51 spotted the B-29 formation, 107 superfortresses from the 73rd Bomb Wing. The bombers were heading for the Nakajima Aircraft Factory at Musashino. The fighters moved into escort position, spread out in layers above and around the bombers, eyes scanning for interceptors. That's when Japanese radar operators started reporting the formation. Standard response. Scramble the interceptors. Flight Sergeant Shimizu launched from Chofu Airfield at 0935 hours. His Kai-84 Hayate, Frank, in American designation, climbed hard. The Kai-84 was one of Japan's best fighters. Nakajima Hay-45 engine producing 1,900 horsepower. Top speed 427, MAPH. Excellent climb rate. Good armament. Two 20 mm cannons and two 12.7 mm machine guns. Shimizu had 17 confirmed kills. He knew how to attack B-29 formations. Come in from above and ahead. Target the lead bombers. One pass, firing at maximum range, then dive away before the defensive gunners could track you. Climb again, reposition, repeat. 
the Americans couldn't do anything about it. Their bombers were too slow, too unwieldy, and they had no fighter escort. Except this time, they did. Shimizu broke through the cloud layer at 18,000 feet and saw them. P-51 Mustangs, dozens of them, weaving through the bomber formation. Flying top cover. Flying escort. Over Tokyo. He couldn't process it. His radio came alive with confused chatter. Single-engine fighters over the capital. Impossible. Those are Mustangs. How did they get here? Where did they come from? The Japanese pilots were scrambling their tactics. They'd trained to attack unescorted bombers. Now they had to fight through fighter escort over their own capital. Some Japanese fighters tried to attack anyway. They died. The P-51s had altitude. They had position. They had training. American pilots had been fighting in Europe for two years. They knew energy tactics. They knew how to work in pairs. They knew how to use their aircraft's strengths. The P-51 could outdive, out-accelerate, and outgun the Kai-84. When Japanese fighters tried to attack the bombers, Mustangs dove on them from above. Boom and zoom attacks. Closing at 500 Malbarkais, firing from 300 yards, blowing through the formation, zooming back to altitude. Japanese pilots who tried to dogfight found themselves in turning battles against aircraft that could turn inside them at high speed. Other Japanese pilots, seeing the trap, broke off, returned to base, radioed warnings, single-engine fighters over Tokyo. The strategic implications were shattering. If American fighters could reach Tokyo, nowhere in Japan was safe. The homeland wasn't a sanctuary anymore. Interceptor pilots couldn't operate with impunity. They had to fight through escort to reach the bombers, and fighting through escort meant losing fighters, losing experienced pilots. Losing the defensive edge that had kept bomber losses high. The mathematics had shifted. Suddenly, attacking B-29 formations was dangerous. The mission lasted 7 hours and 36 minutes total. Landing back at Iwo Jima, several P-51s had less than 50 gallons of fuel remaining. Some pilots reported their low-fuel warning lights were on for the last 30 minutes. One pilot, Lt. Robert Kuby, ran out of fuel on final approach and dead-sticked his Mustang onto the runway, zero gallons remaining. The margin had been that thin. But all 108 fighters returned. The B-29s lost zero aircraft to fighter attack. Zero. The next mission was April 12th. Then, April 16th. Then, they kept coming. By May 1945, P-51 escorts over Tokyo were routine. Japanese Fighter Command had to completely revise their tactics. Instead of swarming bomber formations with aggressive attacks, they had to engage the escorts first. That meant fuel burned, ammunition expended, and pilots lost before they ever reached the bombers. The statistical impact was immediate and devastating. On unescorted missions earlier in 1945, bomber losses averaged 4-6% per mission. With fighter escort, losses dropped to under 1%. The Japanese were losing experienced pilots faster than they could train replacements. By July, Japanese fighter opposition over Tokyo had collapsed. Not because they ran out of aircraft, but because they ran out of pilots willing to suicide against overwhelming American fighter superiority. The engineering achievement rippled forward. The impossible mission to Tokyo proved that with external tanks, creative fuel management, and operational discipline, single-engine fighters could fly unprecedented distances. That concept evolved into modern aerial refueling. If you could extend range with drop tanks, you could extend it further with in-flight refueling. Today, F-15s and F-16s routinely fly 2,000-plus mile missions with aerial refueling. The tanker concept traces directly back to those P-51 pilots watching fuel gauges over the Pacific, calculating whether they'd make it home. But the deeper lesson was strategic. In April 1945, Japanese engineers had proven mathematically that American fighters couldn't reach Tokyo. They were right. The standard P-51 couldn't. But American engineers didn't accept impossible. They found the margins, external tanks, fuel management, mission profiles. They added up small advantages until the impossible became barely possible. Then pilots flew those barely possible missions and made them routine. That's the mathematics that changed the war. Not better aircraft. Not more powerful engines just refusal to accept the existing calculations. 
Flight Sergeant Shimizu survived the war. In interviews decades later, he described that April morning over Tokyo as the moment he knew Japan would lose. Not because of the bombs falling. Not because of the industrial capacity America demonstrated. But because American fighters were flying combat air patrol over the Imperial Palace. That meant American engineers had solved a problem Japanese engineers said couldn't be solved. And if they could do that? What else could they do? What other impossible problems would they solve? The psychological impact of seeing those Mustangs over Tokyo, of knowing the enemy had reached your capital with single-engine fighters everyone swore couldn't make the journey, was more devastating than any bombing raid. The mission parameters were insane. 1,500 miles, zero margin for error. Fuel calculated to the gallon, no combat reserves. One mistake meant death in the Pacific, but 108 pilots flew it anyway because B-29 crews needed them and they came home. All of them. Then they did it again. And again. And the impossible mission became the mission that ended the war. Because sometimes, the difference between impossible and inevitable is just an engineer willing to sharpen their pencil and run the calculations one more time. Sometimes it's a pilot willing to trust those calculations while flying over an ocean with a fuel gauge approaching empty. Sometimes impossible just means no one's been desperate enough to try yet. Tokyo was 1,500 miles from Iwo Jima. The P-51 couldn't fly 1,500 miles. Except it could. And that made all the difference. 